chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 7. We will read through verse 19. Taking a big chunk today. This, we're in uncharted territory. We're, we're going to try to make it through 12 verses, though, if we can. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 is where we will begin. Just a refresher. We don't know who the writer of Hebrews is or exactly who the folks are that he is writing to. However, uh, we can conclude that they are Jewish, and it appears by all accounts through his writing that they are Christians. This is pretty obvious to us just based on some of the language. One of the, one of the big clues that it's written to Jewish people is the fact that it's titled Hebrews. Uh, another clue is the fact that the content that's being dealt with, he's dealing with angels, he's dealing with Moses, he's dealing with the law, he's dealing with the priesthood, he's dealing with sacrifices. Well, the only group that these things would have been important to uh, would have been the Jewish people. Now, I say that uh, at this point, Jesus had come and, and the Gentile people didn't, didn't do these things. And so these things were very important to the Jewish people and they were tempted to continue to do these things, even though they had come to knowledge in Jesus Christ. Now, it seems clear that they are Christians because of how the writer of Hebrews refers to them. At the beginning of chapter 3, he calls them holy brothers. And here we see again as we read through the book that they are referred to as brothers. They are companions uh, in the heavenly calling, he says at the beginning of chapter 3. So these are Jewish people who have come to faith in Jesus Christ, but yet due to persecution, they are being tempted to return to their old ways that will not save them. And the book of Hebrews is an encouragement. It is a warning saying, look, do not turn from Jesus Christ, but hold steadfast to Jesus. And so the first two chapters we looked at were really focused on angels, that Jesus was better than the angels. We saw last week that Jesus is better than Moses. And today we continue on reflecting back on a story of the Old Testament in which Moses was a part of. And so we'll get into that. So let's read through the text, then we'll pray, and then we'll get started. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. Watch out, brothers, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that departs from the living God. But encourage each other daily while it is still called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. For we have become companions of the Messiah if we hold firmly until the end the reality that we had at the start. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who heard and rebelled? Wasn't it really all who came out of Egypt under Moses? And who was he provoked with for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And who did he swear to that they would not enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you today and your word is good. Dear Lord, your word is rich and it's full of so many things for us to consider. And dear Lord, I pray today that you bring to the forefront the things that we need to hear. God, I pray today that we would hear these words of encouragement and these words of warning, that we would listen to you today, that we would listen to these words. God, I pray that you help me not to ramble on. I pray that you help me what I need to say, no more and no less. God, I pray that Jesus be glorified in this place. I pray that we would be lifted up to you today, those who are yours. I pray, God, that if there are some today, perhaps they are not yours that they would come to you today when they hear your voice. God, I pray that they would hear your voice, that they would hear your word, that the Holy Spirit would touch their heart. God, I pray that you'd forgive my pride. I pray that you would take away any fear or worry that's in me, dear Lord, that today that you would be glorified. So I pray, God, that you speak through me and to each one of us this morning. 
And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Often we see in the book of Hebrews that the writer of Hebrews quotes the Old Testament. Another clue that this is written to a Jewish audience. People who would have known what we call the Old Testament. We have seen countless uh, uh, callbacks to the Old Testament. References to the Old Testament. Every little section that we have looked at, there is almost always a verse that he is drawing his audience back to. And he's constantly doing that because he's trying to tell his audience that, look, this is what you know. And as good as what you know is and as good as what you know was, there were some flaws with what, what you know. And Jesus is better than those things. And that's why he's bringing up all of these Old Testament references to show his audience, hey, wait a minute. If you want to go back to these old ways, maybe the past isn't as good as you remember it. And so he brings them back to a story of the past. And he quotes here from Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11. Now, that is a psalm of David, as we see in Hebrews chapter 4. It's, it's referenced as the psalm of David. But interestingly enough, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it neat to hear that he says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, he attributes the words of Psalm 95 as words that are coming from the Holy Spirit. Now, instead of going back to the Old Testament text that talked about these events that he's covering... Instead, he quotes from Psalm 95, and there appears to be a reason for that. And that is because the language that is used in Psalm 95 seems to be very important to the author of Hebrews. And that's what we see. Today, if you hear his voice, now that's, that is starting this section that's pretty much a direct quote of Psalm 7, uh, 95 verses 7 through 11 here. Today, if you hear his voice, you're going to see this. That's going to continue throughout this chapter and into chapter 4. Now this little section here is kind of a kind of a little parenthesis. It's kind of like a in the middle of what he's talking about. You remember at the end of chapter 2 he began talking about the priesthood and then he kind of alluded to that a little bit at the beginning of chapter 3 and now we have this section where we're kind of he's kind of stepping out for for a minute. Sometimes sometimes the preacher does that. They'll be on one topic and then they'll kind of get off on another topic. And then they'll end up preaching like two sermons in one, and then they'll kind of tie it back into their first topic. You've seen that before. You've heard that before. Well, that's kind of maybe what's going on here. He's, he's begun to, to briefly introduce the priesthood and how that relates to Jesus. And now he's stepping out a little bit, and he's saying, oh, by the way, here's some warning, and, and let me talk about this passage. And so it's very important to him, this passage, because he continually uses this, this, this part of this passage. Today, if you hear his voice, he wants his audience to listen. Today, if you hear his voice. That is to say, when David wrote this Psalm 95, he was referencing this event in the past when Moses was leading the people and they were not not wanting to follow God in any way, shape, or form. And they would not listen to God and they were disobedient. And when David recalls that story, what is he saying to his audience in Psalm 95? He's saying, today, if you hear his voice, listen to him. That is, it's not too late for you. Now, while you're still breathing, while you're here today, while your ears are listening, listen to the word of God today. Because as long as there is today, there is a chance for you to call out to God and for you to seek God. So today... While it is still called today, today while you can, today may be your last day. Tomorrow is not today, today is today. And today is our opportunity to hear the word of God, to obey the word of God, and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And that was the struggle of this Hebrew audience. They were being tempted to turn from Jesus because of things that were going on in their life. And the author of Hebrews says there is no one else to turn to. Now, whatever your struggles may be today, whatever your sin may be today, whatever your temptation may be today, hear God's voice. And what's the warning here? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now, that's a scary thing to think about. These are scary warnings that we see throughout the book of Hebrews. He says, do not harden your heart to the word of God, to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but let God work in our hearts, that we would call out to God, that we would repent of our sins, that our hearts would not grow callous, that the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit speaks, that we listen to the Holy Spirit. 
Let us not miss our opportunity if the Holy Spirit speaks to us today to call us to repentance, to call us to faith in Jesus Christ today. If you hear His voice, if you hear the Holy Spirit, if you hear the Word of God, do not harden your hearts, He says. Now that, that warning and that message is good for us. It was good for David when he wrote those words in Psalm 95. It was good for the author of Hebrews when he wrote it to his audience. And it's good for this group of folks in Enterprise Baptist Church in 2023. If we hear the voice of God, we need to listen to the voice of God. And how many times do we hear the voice of God and we do not listen to the voice of God? It gets us in a lot of trouble. And there's plenty of evidence of that through the Old Testament. There's plenty of things we can look at and that's what the author of Hebrews does. He says, hey, wait a minute. You're on a dangerous track. When you stop listening to the word of God and your heart becomes hard, you are entering the danger zone. You're entering a bad place. And he says to his audience here, do not enter this place. Do not turn from Jesus Christ, but listen and remember now, the Jewish people, they love the past. They love Abraham, and they love Moses, and they love the old ways. But the author of Hebrews says, hold up. You want to talk about your ancestors? You want to talk about the greatness of Moses? Well, let's see what your ancestors did under the leadership of Moses. And that's why he says here, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. Now let's have a history lesson right quick. God's people were enslaved. He had already promised that they were going to go into the promised land and Abraham and his family and descendants were there briefly and not long after that, they ended up, due to a famine, making their way to Egypt. Beautiful story. We've talked about that in the past. Not today. God eventually delivered his people from that slavery, and he used Moses to do so. He called Moses, and Moses led those people out of slavery, and they were on their way, and they were right at the cusp. They were right at the edge of the promised land that God said, this is going to be your land. Now, up to this point, God's people had been pretty disobedient. They had not listened to God. They had not trusted in God. And all that God had done and all that they had seen through the plagues and the parting of the Red Sea and all the things that happened during God's deliverance of them and bringing them to the promised land, they still were grumbling and complaining about what God had done. Now they get right up there to the edge of the promised land and Moses sends some guys in. He says, I'm going to send in 12 spies to go into the promised land, and I want you guys to go in there and tell me what it's like and even bring back some grapes, bring back some of the fruit of the land because God says, I'm sending you to a land flowing with milk and honey. That is to say it's going to be abundant. Everything you want and need will be there, and it will be wonderful. It'll be a land of your own, a land of freedom. You're coming from a land of slavery, but I'm sending you to a land of freedom and provision where I will be your God and be in your presence and take care of you. All I ask, God says, is just follow me and be obedient to me and do not put any, any other gods before me and love each other. That's what God says. So Moses sends these spies out into this land. It's going to be wonderful. And they get there and they see some big dudes there. They see some giants there and they say, hold up. Now Moses said, now you need to go and you need to see if they're going to be in encampments or if they're going to be in fortified cities. That is, are they going to be in tents or are they going to be in castles? If they're going to be in tents, no problem. We'll go right in there and we'll get them. But if they're going to be in castles, hold up. We better look out. And so they sent these, Moses sent these spies into the promised land, into Hebron, which is kind of on the, the bottom part of, of, of the land of, of Israel. And when they get there, they see these big old giants. They see these big old dudes. And of the 12 that went up there, they come back and 10 of them said, hold up, we are in big trouble. These guys are big and they are strong and we don't need to go in there. Well, there were two that... that that went and, and they said, look, no, we need to listen to what God said. One of them was Joshua, who ended up being the one who took Moses' place when Moses was gone. And the other one was a guy by the name of Caleb. And Caleb said, look, we need to go. If God says this is our land, it really don't matter how big these dudes are, we can take them. 
Well, the people of Israel, they heard the report of the other ten, and they grumbled and they complained, and God became very angry. They, they said, look, we should have stayed where we are. It would have been better for us to die in the wilderness. And God says, you got it. God says, if you want to die in the wilderness, you will die. I'm going to destroy you, God says. Moses, he intercedes. Moses is so good. He's such a faithful leader of the people. And he intercedes for the people. And God says, okay, I won't destroy you on the spot. But I'll tell you what, you're going to wander around aimlessly for 40 years in the wilderness. And that's exactly what happened. And these people wandered in rebellion because of the hardness of their hearts, because they did not listen to what God had told them. They did not pay attention to what God had shown them. And so that generation, 20 years and younger, uh, were the only ones who entered into the promised land. And all those older folks that questioned God and doubted God, they wandered in the wilderness and they died. And that's the story that's being recalled here. That's the story that David is using in Psalm 95. That's the story that the author of Hebrews is using here when he says, okay, Moses was the leader of these people, and here's what happened to these people. They didn't enter into the promised land. They did not enter into the rest of God. Why? Because of their disobedience and because of their unbelief and because of the hardness of their hearts. Now, praise the Lord, one better than Moses has come, one who can lead his people into a better promised plan, into a better place of rest. But how do we enter that place? We enter it in the same way that all the folks of the Old Testament would have entered that place, and that is by faith. That's by faith. That's the key throughout the Scripture. That's the key to entering into the presence of God and being God's people. God's people are those who trust God and seek God and live in obedience to God and have faith in God. And the people of the Jewish day, that many of the Jewish people, they would often say things like, oh, we have Abraham as our father. But even John the Baptist called them out on that early on in his ministry in Matthew chapter uh, 3 we see a uh, reference to this very, uh, very thing. And John the Baptist tells them, And don't presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Now, many of the Jewish people of Jesus' day and John the Baptist's day, they were trusting in the fact that we are Jewish people. Therefore, God is going to save us. And John the Baptist was calling these folks out. He said, look, you are a brood of vipers. Holy smokes. And he said to them, you may have Jewish blood in your veins, but he says, that doesn't mean anything. Why? Because their heart was not right. And he says, God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones. That is to say, you guys are not any better than these stones because there is nothing in you that God is going to say because you have no faith in God, because you're living in disobedience and because you're living in unbelief. Jesus uses somewhat similar language when he rode into town during the triumphal entry. In uh, Luke chapter 19, verses 39 and 40, after all the people were putting the palm branches down and, and putting their coats on the ground, the Pharisees and th those Jews who hated Jesus did not like this at all. They're praising Jesus coming in on the donkey. And this is what it says in Luke 19, 39. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. Now, John the Baptist had already said, look, the stones are, are, are better than you are if you're going to continue in disobedience to God. And here, the Pharisees refused to cry out to, to Jesus Christ for who he was, the Messiah. And Jesus says again, hey, the stones would cry out. What you refuse to do, what you, what you say, look, I'm never going to call out to Jesus. Jesus said, look, even the stones would cry out. That tells us of the hardness of the hearts of some of the Jewish people. And so the author of Hebrews is giving a warning. He's saying here, look, pay attention. You're not going to be saved just because you're Jewish people. You're going to be saved if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. We see plenty of examples of that very thing in the Old Testament. There were plenty of the nation of Israel, and they died in disobedience. One story we looked at a few weeks ago, the story of Korah and the ones who rose up in rebellion against God. And what did God do? God opened up the ground and he swallowed them.
followed them. We see examples in the Old Testament of Gentiles who are brought into the nation of Israel, who become part of the people of God. And how did they become the people of God? It is by their faith. One great example of that is Rahab in the Old Testament. The author of Hebrews even points that example out. Uh, in Hebrews chapter Chapter 11, verse 31, it says, By faith, Rahab the prostitute received the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who disobey. Who are those who disobey? It is those who don't listen to the word of God. Now, in the case of Rahab, it was a Gentile people that were destroyed. But Rahab was spared. And why was she spared? It was because of her faith. But then you turn the page one chapter over, and yet here is Achan, who was part of the nation of Israel, and yet he is destroyed. Why? Because of his disobedience. There is a theme that we see throughout the Old Testament. Yes, God is faithful to save that faithful remnant. But only those who are faithful. There are plenty who are disobedient, who live in disbelief, and God does not spare those. Those that God spares that make up his people, that make up his kingdom, are those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, or those who listen to him and believe his word and trust in him. Paul gives a very similar warning in Romans chapter 9. Or excuse me, Romans chapter 9 through 11. Now he's talking about the Jewish people here in Romans chapter 9 through 11. And he's also talking about the Gentile people. And he's giving a warning to his audience, which is not so unlike the warning we see here in Hebrews. Romans chapter 11, verses 20 through 23. True enough, they were broken off by unbelief. Now, in the context here, he's speaking about the Jewish people. That is, he had said in his writing, look, not all, of, not all of Israel's heart is hard. Yeah, there were some. There were the Pharisees. There were some who rejected Jesus. But praise the Lord, there were some who looked forward to the promise. There are some Jewish people who did not harden their heart, but they did put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But what of those who did not? He says they were broken off. Now he's using the illustration here of a tree. And Israel is that tree. And the nation of God, the kingdom of God is rooted in that nation of Israel because Jesus comes through that nation of Israel. But the ones who make up that tree, the one who stay in that tree, are the ones who have faith in God and continue to believe. What does Paul say in Romans? He says those who did not believe, in this case the Jewish people, they were broken off because of their unbelief. Continuing on. True enough, they were broken off by unbelief. But you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Whoa, this is pretty serious language. He's saying, look, there were some of God's people, and they had Jewish blood flowing through their veins, but they were broken off from the kingdom of God because of their unbelief. And what does he say to his Christian audience here? He says, you were grafted into the tree. You are made as part of God's kingdom by what? By your blood? Nope. Because of your faith. You are made part of the tree. You were brought into the kingdom of God because of your faith. But then he gives them a warning. He says, do not be arrogant. Do not think that you're better than the Jewish people he's saying here. Do not be arrogant, arrogant but be afraid. And what is his warning here? It's similar to that we see in Hebrews and we saw last week. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. What is he calling them to? He's calling them to stand firm in faith in Jesus Christ. Continuing on in verse 22. Therefore, consider God's kindness and severity. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness toward you if you remain in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not remain in unbelief, will be grafted in because God has the power to graft them in again. Good news, he says. Good news. The grace of God is good for everybody. It's good for the Jew. It's good for the Gentile. There is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile in Christ. And he says, look, you guys have come to Christ through faith. They have been cut off by unbelief. But he says if they would come to faith in Jesus Christ, if they would only believe, they could be grafted back into the kingdom of God, not because of their bloodline, but because of their faith in Jesus Christ. 
And so the author of Hebrews is telling his audience here, he's trying to help his audience understand, hey, look, you need to stay planted in Jesus Christ. You don't want to turn from Jesus Christ. You are saved by your faith in Jesus Christ. And he says at the end of the few verses that we looked at here, in verses 18 and 19, and who did he swear to that they would not enter his rest if not those who disobeyed? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. We see those words often, disobedience and unbelief. He's telling his audience here, do not be like those in the wilderness. What was the problem with those in the wilderness? Yes, they were led by Moses, and Moses was a great guy. But guess what? They didn't enter the, the, the rest of God. They did not enter the promised land, and why not? They did not enter into the presence of God in the promised land and receive his rest because of their disobedience and because of their unbelief. And this is the danger zone that the audience of Hebrews is in. They are in this danger zone in which they are, which, which they are becoming disobedient to God and, and their faith is beginning to waver. And the author of Hebrews says you are in a dangerous place. He says, you better watch out. You better not harden your heart. You better listen. You better remember the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've got to know that there is hope in none other than Jesus Christ. You, you look back at your ancestors. You look back at Moses, and they failed. They failed because of their disobedience and their unbelief. And the author of Hebrews says, you will be no better off. If you continue to live in disobedience and unbelief, but he says, I call to you today. If you would just stand in your faith, you'll find the rest of God, a better rest than that that Moses and Joshua ultimately was going to bring the people into. And we will talk more about that next week. And so these are strong words for us to consider today. These are very strong and difficult words for us to think about, but they are words of warning that we need to hear. Perhaps sometimes we like to avoid such scriptures. We like to avoid such topics because they are difficult. But today, let us be those who hear. Let us not be those who avoid the word of God because it is difficult. But let us be those who hear the word of God and say, Okay, God, is there hardness in my heart? And if there is, God, I pray that you would soften that up. We do have a good encouraging word here in verse 13. But encourage each other. Daily, while it is still called today, so that none of you is hardened by sin's deceptions. Encourage each other. He's, he's, he's giving them a word of, of warning, but in the midst of this warning, he's calling for encouragement. He's calling for encouragement, and we can be encouraged today. Perhaps there is hardness in our heart today and sin in our life today, but we need to be encouraged that God can break our heart, that God can soften our heart, that God can forgive our sins, whatever they may be. Let us be encouraged by that fact. And where is our encouragement? It is found in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. That's where the encouragement comes from, and that's who the audience was tempted to turn from. And perhaps there are even some in this room today that are being tempted to turn to something in the world for their deliverance, for their, for their hope. And there is deliverance, there, excuse me, there is not deliverance and there is not hope in anything in this world apart from Jesus Christ. I can encourage you today by telling you that Jesus wants to give you rest, that he wants to forgive your sins. And we enter into the rest of Jesus Christ when we come to him in obedience and when we come to him in faith. So let us heed these words today. Today, if you hear his voice, perhaps you've been putting off God for years. Perhaps you say, well, maybe next Sunday I'm going to I'm going to give my life to Christ. Maybe next Sunday. And maybe, maybe next Sunday's been coming for 7, 8, 10, 20 years now. But today is the day. Today, if you hear his voice, there is no guarantee of a tomorrow for you. You may not be here tomorrow. You may not be here next Sunday. And if you continue to live, uh, live in sin and harden your heart, then woe unto us. It's a very scary thing that the author of Hebrews is pointing out here. So let us be encouraged that today there's a chance. If you feel like there's hardness in your heart and you're worried about that, then praise the Lord. That's a good feeling. 
Even that feeling is a good sign. It shows that you want to repent. It shows that you care. And if you care today, know that God cares for you. If you care today, know that Jesus died so that you could be forgiven. If you would repent today, if you would call out to God today, He is faithful to forgive your sins. To those who confess their sins to Him, He is faithful there's hardness in our hearts today then we need to repent perhaps today you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ but listen to the words of David listen to the word of Hebrews today if you hear his voice do not be those who disobey do not be those who live in unbelief but know that God time and time again from the Old Testament to the New God has shown that he is faithful to those who are faithful to him. But we see so many warnings of God bringing instructions on those who are not obedient to him, both <clears throat> Gentiles and Jews alike. The difference, what makes all the difference in the world is not who we are or where we're from or the blood that flows through our veins, but whether or not we are covered by the precious blood of Jesus Christ today. Let us today be those who fall down before God let us be those today who repent. Let us be those who to seek to live a life of obedience and faith so that we don't fall into the trap of a hardened heart. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you today. We thank you for your good words. And I pray, God, that you would just help us to see what may be in our hearts that shouldn't be there. Dear Lord, maybe, maybe we are already aware of it. Maybe we knew before we came into this place that there's something amiss in our life. Dear Lord, I pray today that maybe your Holy Spirit has helped us to see that maybe in a more powerful way and do not, let us, do not let us reject that truth that you have revealed to us today. God, I pray that you would just help us to understand your word, to live by your word. God, maybe there are things in life and seasons in life when, when life is so tough and we are tempted to fall back to things of our past for comfort and strength. But dear Lord, let us not ever do so. Let us trust in Jesus Christ and know God that Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us, God. So maybe there are some today who are walking through the valley, God. I pray that they'd walk with you, that they'd not turn, that they would not run, that they would not seek anything or anyone else, but that they would walk by your side. God, maybe there are some today and they are not yours. Maybe they have lived their life in disobedience and unbelief. And maybe today, dear Lord, they want to put their trust in you. Maybe they have already, dear Lord, as, as we were looking through your word, maybe they have repented and confessed their sins and put their faith in you. God, if, if there are some in this room that have done that, I pray that they would come forward. We can baptize them, God. Dear Lord, maybe there are some in this room today who are yours and due to sin and, and just lack of caring, dear Lord, we haven't, we haven't been seeking you. We hadn't been living for you. Dear Lord, let us repent of such things. Let us bring those things before you. Turn our life around that we would not continue to live in that way. God, perhaps we are like the scripture that says, we believe but help our unbelief. Dear Lord, perhaps there are some in here today and they certainly have faith in you, but, but even for, for those, dear Lord, maybe there are still areas of our life where our faith is not what it should be. So God, I pray that today that, that we would all leave this place as those who believe. But God, should there be any unbelief in our heart today, I pray that you'd reveal it to us and help us to repent of that. God, we thank you for the goodness of Jesus Christ that we are covered by his precious blood. God, let us be those who live by faith. Let us be those who live by obedience. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.